Hi, everyone, and welcome again to another one of my Podbean podcasts and YouTube videos on my channel, GaudiumAtSpez22.com. I am Dr. Larry Chap. I'm really excited tonight because I'm, I'm being joined by Eric Ibarra, uh, who a lot of you know. He's kind of famous in Catholic social media circles. And what, what's interesting, uh, Eric will get a chuckle out of this. I mean, a few years ago, I actually blocked him on Facebook for some. I, I can't even remember why. You must have said something, Eric, that really just pissed me off or something. I don't know what it was. So I blocked you. But then uh, and I don't even I really honestly don't know why. And so then our, our friend Carson Weber, our mutual friend Carson Weber, uh, wrote to me one day and he says, you know, there's this guy I really like. And it seems to me you two would get along and and you should take a look. And it's Eric Ibarra. And I looked on my block list and sure enough, there you were. So I unblocked you and the rest is history. Here we are. Uh, Eric um, is a revert uh, from Protestantism back to Catholicism. And because of that reversion, he became very interested in the various divisions of the Christian faith, Protestant, Catholic, Orthodox. And he has uh, schooled himself and taught himself. He's an autodidact theologically uh, to, to, a, to an extent that I have rarely seen in an individual. So I, I, I'm very impressed with it and respect the heck. I, whenever I read his stuff on social media, I'm, go, I'm reminding myself, see, you don't need a Ph.D. to do high level theology at all. And Eric does do high level theology. It's great stuff. Uh, and the other thing I re admire and respect by Eric, why I'm excited to have him on the show is he's not afraid to follow the truth where he thinks it's going to lead him. He's not uh, he's not beholden to some overarching, very oppressive sort of intellectual straitjacket ideology at all. He's a man of faith and he goes where the faith leads him, uh, wherever the truth leads him. And uh, and so w once in a while, we, we don't always agree on. So we, we've disagreed on the Balthazari and dare we hope stuff. So we won't we won't get into that uh, at all tonight. Tonight. Uh, and, and he also has uh, his own channel, as you see there. Classical Christian thought classical. So welcome. Welcome to the show, Eric. Hey, thank you so much for uh, that introduction. That was too kind of you. And uh, I did get a chuckle out of that, that that that. Uh, that does uh, strike accurate to me that there was a time where I was blocked, but um, we're over that hump and, oh. and I'm glad we are. <laughs> yes. Yes, we are. I have no idea why, uh, why I blocked you, but anyway, because I rarely block people, but there you go. Well, I started it to block people recently and, and um, it, because it, some people can just be so persistent yeah. that they become a, a, a weight on your, um, life. So uh, I've actually, I, I never wanted to do that, but I started doing it with certain people. And uh, unfortunately, that's just the case. I, I, I have had the experience in the past year, you and I are both kind of social media, Catholic public figures. And so, yeah, you get these, you get these people that do dog you. And uh, I had, I did have an instance where I Somebody was uh, commenting on my articles in Catholic World Report. He got blocked there for being obnoxious. So then he started commenting on my Facebook page. I blocked him there. So then he started emailing me. Yeah. <laughs> you I, know, I, private. I <clears throat> so I, I, you know, spammed him out, blocked him out in my email. So anyway, yeah. uh, that I'm sure we all have that experience on some level or another. Tonight, though, uh, what, what, what I want to discuss with, with Eric is is the I guess we're going to call it La Fer Fernandez, uh, you know the, the the Fernandez affair. There's there's been so it seems like, and you you can riff on this when I'm done with my riff. Um, it seems like ever since uh, uh, Pope Francis put Cardinal Fernandez at first Archbishop Fernandez, now Cardinal Fernandez, in charge of the CDF, a uh, uh, DDF. Sorry. That that events have begun to accelerate. It's like okay, uh, we had uh, Ladaria, Colonel Ladaria, in charge of the of the DDF for a long time, and there was the 2021 response zoom that came out from there saying, no, you can't have gay blessings, you can't bless homosexual couples, and so on, and everything just seemed kind of in a stasis. And all of a sudden, Fernandez hits the scene as the new chief of the of the DDF, and all of a sudden, boom, you get the the motu proprio from the Pope on the, the reform of theology, which some people think was inspired by uh, Fernandez. Then you get fiducia supplicans and its clarification. 
and, and now, of course, you're getting this bombshell that came out today, this book that he wrote in 1998 uh, that is sort of and I want to be careful. I don't want to say things out loud because people have children sometimes listening to this podcast in their car. But it was very graphic stuff yeah. where he's equating a kind of human eroticism very graphically with our experience of God. Now, he has repudiated the book and said he took it out of print and he took it out of print because he realized very soon that it was a mistake. Okay. So I'll give him credit for that. But anyway, so there's all these things floating around. So let's, let's, um, you can start wherever you want to start, but let's start with fiducia supplicants. Cause I know you've written on this extensively. I've followed your, your social media posts on this and I, and I liked what you had to say very much. So, it, it, so maybe you could go through fiducia for us, what your problems are with it. Yes. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, yeah, so when when fiducia supplicans came out, um, you know, I read the document and I was kind of like nodding in my head as I was going through. Like I knew this was going to happen because <laughs> in 2020, uh, in 2020, I believe I wrote a post on Facebook and on my blog where I, I thought to myself, you know, the Germans are. They're, they're, they're coming into a, a little bit of a tussle with, with Rome on this issue with the blessing of uh, same-sex couples. And I thought to myself, well, maybe the Germans will just like come up with some, some way to um, do what, to be scandalous, but orthodox. You know, you have the sayings out there like, I'm, I'm Eastern Orthodox, but in communion with Rome, you've got these slogans out there. It's almost yeah. like they should come up with one that's like scandalous, but technically orthodox, right? And <clears throat> I, I thought to myself, well, maybe if they just said that they're not blessing the sinful aspects of the union, and maybe if they come out with a way to say that they're blessing the persons um, for the sake of the good in the relationship, you know, maybe we could start there, you know? And everybody was like, no, that would be terrible, Eric. That would be heretical. And I thought to myself, well, I mean, it may be heretical. It may be wrong. But in my mind, I, I think I could think I, I, I can picture a group of really smart theologians, even Thomistic ones, who would employ the distinctions necessary to get it into the orange cones of orthodoxy. <laughs> and pe people were like, uh, I don't know about that. Well, when Fiducia Supplicants came out, I was like, wow, let me go rush and find, look in my file cabinet for my article. And I, and sure enough, I put, put side by side and it was the same thing. It, only this time, it wasn't the Germans introducing it. It was Rome. Yeah. And uh, so it was a shocker at the same time as it was this, you know, my anticipations being met. Um, and I thought to myself, well, I know what's going to happen here. They're going to, people are going to emphasize that they reiterated and reaffirmed the doctrine and dogma on marriage, on matrimony, and on yep. the moral unacceptability of uh, same sex sexuality, right? Um, I mean, the Church of England did the same thing in December, just last month. They, they said marriage is between one man and one woman. And sexuality is only appropriate for that. But, and then they have right. a whole list of things, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and so Fiducia does, you know, reaffirms the dogma. And I thought to myself, I know what's going to happen now. People, you got the rad trads that are going to look at that and completely ignore that and go right to the part where it says blessing of same-sex couples. Boom. The, uh, Rome approves either same-sex marriage or same-sex couples and the behavior that goes with it and then i knew that the pope's planners were going to ignore the problems with that pastoral option yeah. and they were just going to focus on the reaffirmation of dogma <laughs> yeah and um so i wrote an article on why it's still a problem even when we have the most generous take from both sides it's still it's still an issue because it lacks it lacks clarity and the clarity that it does have 
only generates more questions about other things, you know? And um, so, yeah, I wrote, wrote that article because I knew that people were going to say, well, it's not the unions. It's not the unions. It's the persons, just the persons. But the pastoral option obviously says blessing of same sex couples. It situates them in a setting where they're in view of everyone who yes. can make the decision. Well, they can't wear wedding garments. Well, why can't they wear wedding garments? So that the onlookers don't mistake it for a wedding. Okay, so then there's onlookers. So this is a public situation <laughs> yeah. with two people um, who are together. They have not. They still plan a life together, and they're 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 coming together. They don't want to come individually. They want to come together, right? And they're being blessed. Yes, the persons are being blessed, but Fernandez makes it clear that the, the blessing has another object in mind, which is the good elements within the relationship that they have. And he, he even admits that this may not materialize or, or it may never come to a point where it's, they repent. We, we hope they do, but it may be for mutual help, mutual assistance, monetary, uh, it could be financial success. It could be a number of different things patience he even said the spirit of dialogue so the, these other things that within the relationship can be enhanced all the while they still plan to be with each other they may not have to defend their they may say well this is not ideal and I'm, we're not saying that yeah that this is the right thing to do but they are planning to continue it um so I, I thought that this is still a problem. This is still a scandal because yeah. um, it, it, it's almost impossible to remove what is being perceived because a lot of people thought, well, the, the doctrine of marriage is reaffirmed. So that can't be misperceived, but, but there's another misperception that could happen. Maybe people can say, well, we know the Catholic church doesn't agree to, to gay marriage, but they They've obviously lowered the standards for what's acceptable to be a Christian or to be a disciple. You know, maybe they right. don't justify, maybe Catholics don't justify the morality of, you know, LGBT, but it looks like they've created a department for that to be somewhat tolerated, maybe not justified but tolerated and that's a problem and 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 the second part which in the last part of the article what that i wrote was was you know emphasizing that two people who refuse to come individually they have to be together um 2000 years of christian common sense has always understood that these people have a temperature that's way too high in their self will for there to be a, 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 a penitential receptivity to the church's gifts. If they can't even say, hey, hon, hey, babe, wait over here while I go individually to be blessed. If they can't even do that and they yeah. have to be together, we're talking about people who are really insisting on their way, even if they don't say it's justified they're still insisting that that's what they're going to do. That's a problem because it gives the idea that you don't have to give up your life and pick up your cross to be my disciple. It does, and then Fernandez says, well, we're not asking them to repent because we're not getting them prepared for a sacrament. Okay, but we've had 2,000 years of how to deal with individuals and to bless individuals. Why is it that now all of a sudden the best way to bless an individual is to bless them in the context of their gay relationship. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, exactly. So it it elicits too many questions. So I, I think that yeah. while I'm not in doctrinal dissent, you know, because we'll probably get into that, uh, yeah, I, I understand that uh, Fernandez parked his feet right at the boundary of, of, of you know, Denzinger, you know. I don't think that Fernandez and Pope Francis or any of those guys are really interested in like trying to change church church teaching. I agree. 
Um, but what they're doing is, is they're parking themselves right at the boundary line. And whether they have good motives or bad motives, I don't know. I'll assume for the sake of this discussion, they have good motives. They want all the people outside that boundary who feel like they can't come in. They want there to be some sort of a, a reevaluation of the pastoral limit that maybe the doctrinal line and the pastoral line don't perfectly, maybe there's a way to flex for the sake of weakness, for the sake of inculpability, for the sake of our complex and difficult circumstances. Um, yeah. And I think that's where that's their like gang hangout. They love to stay in that zone of thinking, the human psyche, how to play with conscience, culpability, their circumstances, the imputability of their fault and whether they, they even if they continue, they may not know the law all the way. They may know the law, but they may not appreciate it all the way. It's like it, it, all this yeah. human psychology is where they stay. They don't want to go to dogma. They don't want to change doctrine, but they want to deal with the human psyche yeah. and how they can flex that and make it elastic enough for the sake of people on the outside. I agree 100% with everything you said. I think that's an absolutely astute analysis. In fact, I had an article that just came out today on Catholic World Report. Yep. Uh, it was basically talking about the problem with this papacy is it deals with moral theology from below instead right. of beginning from above with the call to holiness and sanctification and and all of those you know commandments sermon on the mount all the you know, evangelical councils instead of it beginning there and and then sort of working your way into sort of pastoral gradualness no, they, they begin from below every everything is about mitigating circumstances everything is about you know, psychological impediments to truly embracing the doctrines and so forth. So I think you're absolutely correct, Eric, that they like to live at the boundaries and they're looking over those boundaries at everybody on the other side of those boundaries. And they're waving them in saying, there's a way, there's a way we can do this. There's a way we can finesse this and we're going to get away with it. But I agree with you. I, I don't think Pope Francis has any interest in radically changing church doctrine. I think that he he's do, he's doing something else. But I'm going to come back though to fiducia to some things that you said before uh, with regard it it strikes me as as I was reading fiducia what struck me was lurking in the background of all of this is a clear adjudication and I like what you said about you know we may we may not say that lgbtq stuff isn't sinful in some sense but we're going to tolerate it and we're going to yeah. create a zone for it. So, and I agree with that. And so I'm thinking what's lurking in the background is, you know, come on guys, it's not really that big a deal, right? Yeah. It's not really all that bad or all that sinful. And so I was, th I always like to think up of counter examples and think, okay, instead of a, a two gay guys coming to a priest and the priest knows them and he likes them and you know, they're, they're decent fellows. So that what if it's a, a brother and a sister who are in an incestuous relationship uh, and the priest knows that they're in an incestuous relationship and they're living together uh, in, in this fashion uh, and they come to the priest and, and, and they say, uh, would you please bless us? As, and they're holding hands. OK, I, I don't think Cardinal Fernandez would say that fiducia would say, well, that a priest in that situation should then bless the good aspects of, of their relationship. Let's tease out the good aspects of your relationship, shall we? Because, because when, you, when you put it in these stark categories, you begin to realize the 2021 DDF response was exactly right. You cannot disengage the good elements of the relationship from the overall relationship. Okay. And so the priest would say, well, it's great you brother and sister that you really love each other and have mutuality and care for each other when you're sick and all that. But I can't bless you. Not, not as a couple individually one at a time, but not as a couple. Now I, I, I'm going to rush right in and say, I'm not comparing gay relationship with incestuous. I'm making an analogy here about the fact that clearly a priest wouldn't do that because clearly he would see that that's a bad relationship to even be remotely blessing, no matter how nuanced. 
And yet we wouldn't say that with regard to, say, gay relationships. And so that strikes me. The first thing about Peduce is it's kind of saying it's not really that bad, guys. I think that's great. I, uh, you know, I, I think I heard one person before bring up incestuous relationships as a as a, um, a test case scenario to, to you know, kind of give fiducia a, a critical analysis. But this is the second time I'm hearing it. And the way you put it, um, it basically it puts the full stress on fiducia because can your can your past can your pastoral initiative can it really have any capacity to do this and if it can't well then maybe, maybe we need to dial back enough but all the way back to 2021 where like you said um common christian sense prevailed you know good yeah. elements in a same-sex relationship um that is not powerful enough to overcome what is really going on there, you know? And yeah, so I think the point you make is no. Great. And I've seen other examples that people are given like a, a 50 year old man who leaves his wife and three kids and starts a relationship with his mistress. Who's like 25 years old. And, you know, they're now living together and, you know, and he presents himself to his pastor and says, OK, I've got my new little chippy girlfriend here and we're living together. Could you please bless us? Uh, no, we're, you're not blessing our union. You're blessing us as a couple, though, yeah. but not really as a couple. Yeah, it's it's it, it's just um, when you when you present it in those terms, you begin to realize that this is a document that really was sort of tailor made. It, as I like to say, it's a conclusion in search of an argument. It, you can tell he had sort of he he wanted to find a way to sort of meet the Germans halfway. Let's put it that way and say, OK, we can't do what you guys are saying, but maybe we can do this. And then he comes up with this new kind of non-sacramental sacramental blessing and, and says, OK, this is a kind of innovative development. Now we can do it. And I just really think that's what it was all about. Yeah, I, I think so. And and I think, you know, what you're pointing out there, you know, one with the incestuous relationship, another with this 50 year old man who has another girl. Um, what it's what it what it's proving in my mind. And, and it's one of the reasons why I think um, public um, resistance in some degree is is reasonable is because it's incoherent. Every time a priest will do this, will will say, okay, maybe not in front of the altar, maybe maybe not in a prominent place in the church, but maybe outside in the you know maybe outside where where you know just outside the church we could do this. Every yeah. time you do it, it's going to require a paragraph or two of an explanation. Yeah, because it doesn't matter if there's never going to be a time where it's like oh yeah it's one of those no it's always going to be like what wait a minute and then somebody's going to have to come along and say oh reason in theology here here i have two links for you to listen to two hours of this and another link to read this and it's always going to require a um sort of like a detangling of wires you know like back in the 90s when we had all the you know electronic yeah. stuff and our wires got tangled it's like okay we got to untangle the wires before we can even move things around here it's always going to be a tangled wire that needs to be undone and yeah. even if you can use like correct theology to try and make it so that you know this is passing the x-ray test you know okay there's it it gets in somehow through denzinger or the dogmatic test of the Catholic Church, um, but people are still not going to digest that and think, "Oh, okay." They're going to say, "Okay, I can see how you reasoned that," but man, you did an Olympic. I mean, you 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 won the Olympics yeah. there on yeah. on <laughs> trying to figure out how to unbend that. Yeah, I reminded uh, on a related topic, and then I'm going to come back to Fiducia. Uh, my friend, Peter Kwasniewski, uh, you know, Peter, Peter's yeah. a good guy. I like Peter. Uh, I don't know what you think, but I like Peter. And no, we, we have, we, I mean, we've butted heads before, but uh, we oh, have yeah, I butt with heads with him all the time, but he's a, yeah. he's a good guy yeah. and, and uh, a smart guy. Anyway, 
uh, I re reviewed Bishop Schneider's credo and I kind of chided Peter a little bit because he came out with this very good article, actually a very long, decent article explaining what it is that Bishop Schneider really means when he says the non-baptized don't have full human dignity. And, and I said, you know, you're absolutely right, Peter. There's a way that that can be nuanced. But if it's going to take a seven page dissertation proposal type distinction, then something's wrong. It's a catechism after all. It's not yeah. meant to be uh, that confusing. But anyway, I don't want to get into that. That's a whole different ca kettle of worms, uh, kettle of fish, whatever the metaphor is. Anyway, uh, let's come back to fiducia. And, and before we move on, I want to once again talk about priest blessing other irregular unions other than sort of gay unions. What? What would happen if a polygamous couple approached a priest? And, and there are examples, obviously, in places like Africa, where there are uh, Catholics who practice polygamy. Uh, what is a priest supposed to do in that situation? Or you look at uh, Father James Martin, who's always using the or Cardinal McElroy using the LGBTQ acronym for everything. We have to be sure, you know, what's the B in that? bisexual so i guess we're supposed to be endlessly welcoming to the bisexual community as well so what if a man comes in with his two paramours he lives with these two women and they're in a polyamorous you know he's in a sort of bisexual suit with these women uh and and there's another guy there too so there's like there's like four of them there two guys two gals and they're all, it's it's just a free-for-all in there what's he is he supposed to bless them too after all, you're not allowed to engage in moral interrogation beforehand, says Cardinal Friend, unless you elicit some sort of elitist control over the situation. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I, I think as you pile example after example, it's it's just emphasizing this point that, um, like the point that you made before, which is what is abundantly clear is that rome was under pressure yes to do something um and they met halfway with the germans to keep the letter of orthodoxy while introducing the basic exterior form with a different rationale perhaps but the same exterior form that many german bishops were looking yeah um the question though is was there anybody in the vatican foolish enough to think that the germans and the other europeans are we're going to look at this and say oh you're right let's do it that way let's yeah. completely forget this other thing that we're thinking about doing uh in fact i mean most of the people in germany who are part of the german synodal way that have advocated for full-on liturgical blessings of gay couples quasi crypto marriage uh, are saying that the fundamental problem with fiducia supplicans is that it still treats homosexuals as second class citizens. It, it still treats them as sinners. It still treats them as people in need of repentance. And that's precisely what we're rejecting here. So um, I'm not certain who in the Vatican thought that this, I mean, and as I said to people, if they wanted to respond to the Germans, they already had. In 2021, the yeah. DDF responded to the Germans yeah. and says, uh, no, you cannot do that. End of story. Anyway. Yeah, well, and, and Cardinal Fernandez, at the opening of Fiducia, he prefaces himself by saying some people accepted the, two, the, the 2021 response well, but other he kind of says it in a very gentler, kinder way. Other people didn't. And so that kind of yeah. inspired yeah. the reopening of the whole thing. And, uh, you know, that that's what I think happened. The 2021 document was not well received in some place. We obviously know in Germany. Um, and because of that, instead of the Vatican feeling the, the sense of, well, we're, we're just we're going to guard. We're going to safeguard the holy treasures that the apostolic deposit has handed down right. instead of, instead of feeling boldened, I think they felt pressure and then yeah. did this move, but pressure uh, you're only pressured insofar as you let yourself be pressured. It, you know, yeah. obviously the Germans had a lot of money, so maybe there was some leverage there, but the question that I would have, why would you feel pressure? from a dying church, a dying European church, 
especially the Northern Europeans, where mass attendance is now floating around 4%. And were it not for the church tax, uh, the German church would be completely bankrupt by now. Uh, and, and so why feel that pressure? In fact, it gives the lie to the notion that this Vatican under this pope are all about the peripheries. Because as, as I, I was speaking with an African priest who was involved in the synod and synodality when I was in Rome covering the synod. And what he said to me was what's very clear is all this talk of peripheries is absolute rhetoric and nonsense, because everything that they're concerned about, you know, women, deacons, gay sex, all that's those are those are issues of the global north of the petty bourgeois concerns of the global north. Those are not the concerns of those of us in the global south. Not at all. Uh, and, and there was no synodal. There, I mean, they discussed it at the Senate. They didn't get what they wanted. And so, boom, out comes fiducia supplicans, you know, and, 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 and the, the Africans are looking at, well, where's the synodality? There was a Spanish bishop I saw at a Catholic news agency he said, you know, I, you might know who the Spanish bishop was. I can't remember his name right now. So well, where's the synodality in this? Yeah. So like when I say pressure, you know, that's me trying to give what normal expectations might predict, but you're absolutely right. It, it, you know, when you, when you put a, uh, when you, when you give a fiery analysis to it, um, it, it's clear that the Vatican, if the Vatican just wanted to maintain its view of 2021, that was perfectly within their power to do this. Um, I've heard rumors about why the 2021 document was a problem for Pope Francis himself. Um, it was, you know, uh, it was actually a presentation that was given by a gentleman who was appointed by Pope Francis to one of the um, the congregations for minors, um, and and he was a uh, he was a victim in the Chile situation yeah. years ago. Yeah. And he gave a presentation at Fordham University that was public. And he gave what he, what, according to him, he said Pope Francis relayed to him personally that after signing that document, he wasn't very happy because of how it was worded, whatever. Um, of course, that's not confirmed. That's just, but it was a public lecture at Fordham University, which um, was actually edited it to remove that after I wrote about it. So I wrote wow. about it. I wrote about it about three months ago. And, um, you know, and I gave the link to the full lecture. And uh, Father James Martin was the MC of the this 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 uh, symposium. And um, I thought to myself, Oh, let me go check this link to make sure it's even there anymore. Well, I went to go check the link, and rather than being 45 minutes long, like the original was, it's 26, 26 minutes long. And it, so it looks like after I wrote my article, somebody decided to go in um, at Outreach. That's well, what was, the, what was the, yeah, Outreach, that's James Martin's group, Outreach, his yeah. web. Uh, well, what, well, what was it in the talk that they, that you think was edited out? What was it that it was it was the it was the part where some I think somebody uh asked in the QA and they said, you know, is Rome showing signs of wanting to change? Because the speaker himself was uh homosexual. Mm -hmm. Um and uh and he's he 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 relayed this information that uh um that you know the Pope told him that he wants to go further but it's not easy to do that given his circumstances with everybody around him and the conservatives. And, and so and he also said that Pope Francis didn't like the 2021 document. Of course, this is all on his shoulders. And, you know, I am, I have an obligation not to believe him because that would incriminate Pope Francis. So I didn't share that information um, with the goal of trying to say we should believe this man. But I think that there is enough of a unexplained problem here to take in all the reports. Yeah, I, I, I would say, too, that you're, you're absolutely right. You, you, the, the Pope deserves the benefit of the doubt from a Catholic because he is right. the Pope. But just off the top of it, it's not outside the realm of possibility because it's happened before. 
where the Pope allows a document to come out of the Vatican that he's not entirely pleased with for reasons of internal curial politics. Okay, I mean, this is just this happens all the time. So that's not outside the realm of possibility. Like, oh, come on. It's got his signature on it. Obviously, he approved. No, it's not necessarily true. Second, the mere fact that the Pope allows fiducia supplicants to come out a mere, you know, three years later, two, three years later, is an indication that maybe he wasn't really happy with the 2021 thing. Then there's the fact that right after that document came out in 2021, Pope Francis, in a couple of public statements, did make some rather looked ambiguous, but it seemed like rather direct swipes at the document where he said he made comments about the need to make sure that we don't stay doctrinally rigid. Right. Or words to that effect. And we need to be you know, more pastorally sensitive to the people on the mark. And it was seems to have been, you know, in the context, a clear reference to that document. Yes. And so I, I, I think that the chance, you know, the chances that Pope Francis either bef- even before the 2021 document was released or as a result of the reception of the 2021 document, that he himself came to see that document as a rigid document is, is probably likely, you know. Yeah, um, you know, it would seem so. I mean, something has to explain why the Vatican said one thing in 2021 with his signature and now it says something else. You know, with it, and I know there are Pope explainers out there. So no, 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 it's in full continuity with the 2021 statement. That well, that's if that's hogwash. Of course, it's not in full continuity with the 2021 statement. Right, and and if, in case the listeners want to go listen to that outreach lecture, it's at it's on outreach YouTube, and uh, it was given by Juan Carlos Cruz. Um, yes. So if if they want, that's a public lecture on YouTube. You'll see it's 26 minutes now, which is significantly less than all the other speakers oh. um, before and after. Um, and uh, Father Martin, Father James Martin, obviously, he was the one hosting the whole event. And um, he was just speaking with glee about what may be coming in the future, which to me, and I think Father James Martin already said that he heard rumors about a document coming out, you know, when he was talking about fiducia. So, uh, it, it's troubling. It's very troubling. I mean, it's troubling that Father Martin is so foregrounded by this papacy uh, to begin with. Let's move on uh, from, unless you have some final comments you'd like to make about Fiduci. I'm sure there's a million, we could spend three hours talking yeah. about it, I'm sure. Um, uh, keep staying on the topic of Cardinal Fernandez. And just because everybody's talking about it, it's the buzz. And I hate to engage in ecclesial gossip. But it does bear kind of on the article that I had today in CWR on moral theology from from below and your statement earlier about how uh, it seems like all the focus is always on mitigating circumstances and so on is Cardinal Fernandez, the, the leak of this 1998 book. And one of the interesting things in there is it, obviously it's very salacious. It's very graphic. But there's also like a paragraph or two in there where he goes in great detail about someone might be objectively sinning and yet he then good lists all of these reasons why. Yeah, but it's still a lot of sin, you know, uh, and, and, and to me, that, despite all the salacious detail details about sex that was in there, that to me was the little bombshell. That's that's what that's what I thought as well, because I, I already knew when I started reading the several, even some of the graphic stuff, I already thought to myself, well, yeah, that's kind of disgusting, but he, he refers back to St. Francis of Assisi, St. Teresa. So I already knew in my mind, okay, what people are going to do here is they're going to find a way to get the tentacles into theology of the body or, or the medieval mysticism. Um, Sure. Some of the some of the uh, uh, nuptial genre language of Song of Psalms, but what really caught my attention was that little bit there because it it was like uh, you know you it's like you, you know if you hear this song that you really don't like and then um, you've heard it so many times and like you want to forget the way that sound that song sounds like. But then, you know, you got your window down at a red light and and another car is blasting it. It's like in the middle of all this stuff, all of a sudden I see 
it is possible. I'm like, oh, oh there's the first beat. It is possible that in a concrete situ in a concrete situation, oh, there's the next beat. Somebody can be living in objective sin. Oh, there's the song. <laughs> yeah, there it is again. There it is. There might be all kinds of psychological impediments and things that have crept up in this person's life that makes it impossible for them to truly appreciate the norm in question and so on and so on and so on. Yeah. Okay. Right. Great. So, it, you know, you're getting down into fundamental option territory here where it's almost impossible for anybody ever to sin ever. Because yeah. I mean, who among us doesn't have a boatload of mitigating circumstances caused by poor potty training when we were two years old or something, right. you know, to get all therapeutic on this? I mean, come on, we all have baggage. I mean, the whole point to the Christian message is come up higher, come out yeah. of that baggage. The, the, the gospel liberates because it says to us there's a way out of that mess. You're not you're not a slave to it. That's right. Uh, come out. And yet it just seems like in that passage that you, it was on your Facebook page today that I was reading, it just screamed out. Eh, forget about it. You, yeah. you know, yeah. forget what's, about it. What's so what's so difficult about it and paralyzing about it? Because that's really what I feel when I when I read that and I and I and I see it being employed today in so much of the the talk about what we're doing with irregular relationships is it's paralyzing because you can't you can't say that the principle that they're talking about is wrong. Like you can't and they know that, you know. So this isn't like, you know, the Kuren days or the Kung days or the Shilabek days right. where they were making propositions that were incriminating propositions, right? We're talking about accomplishing what looks to be the same kind of deviancy, but through an instrument that you can't locate a heresy to because yes. it's, it's, it's within the realm of the elastic possibilities of a human psyche. And so they've, they've, I, I don't know how, I don't want to sound too cynical here, but it seems to me like some of the heretics in the past, they knew that, you know, with the, the condemnations and anathemas that came out of the syllabus of errors and, and even up to Vatican II, that coming out and rejecting Christian doctrine isn't going to change the church. They, they, they feel, realize that's not going to change the church, but maybe what we can do is we can get be, become experts on what is elastic, which is the subjective conditioning of a human person. And yeah. let's become experts in that area. And there we can start chipping away and finding excuse after circumstance, after complexity, after another, to get into what we would normally get to by denying the dogma that would be the instant plan but what we'll do is we'll keep the dogma in place but work in the human psyche so that way it can kind of get in somehow yeah. and then yeah. we'll say yeah well it's not the ideal but none of us are none of us meet the ideal you know so it's like they've done it in such a way that you 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 keep taking you know it's like Legolas getting out his arrows trying to find <laughs> and arrow. you always wonder why doesn't he ever run out of arrows that's what I always <laughs> wanted to know about Legolas the endless supply of arrows back there right and, but and, you're right uh, and and the thing is come on let's face it as as you're reading along in these kinds of things it's very very easy to tell that we're they're talking about our sexual sins that's right. our, our relationship sins these yeah. kinds of sins. Because we don't often have recourse to all of these sort of subjective states and psychological. If you're talking about somebody who's trying to figure out whether or not they want to leave the Ku Klux Klan, or, or right, you don't. There's no nuance there. You say, "Well, or, I was well, yeah, exactly. I, I was raised in the South and deep Alabama. And my dad, my grandpappy was a grand wizard, and my daddy was a grand wizard, and I would be going against my family if I got out of the KKK." You know, and nobody nobody looks at that and, or or some sort of skinhead neo-Nazi walks up and says, well, I don't 
I want to be a Catholic, but I, I still want to do all the Nazi <laughs> ideology. Stuff. No, you, no, no, no. Wait, what are you talking about? Nobody talks this way. Nobody talks this way. Or you're oh, a Catholic bus driver and you, and you tell the African-Americans to go sit in the back. Nobody would say, oh, you've got mitigating circumstances there. Or, or you know, I, I want to drive a car that produces more CO2 than has ever been produced by any vehicle anywhere. And I, well, no, you can't do that. You're not allowed to. Do, well, yes, that's what I wanted. Well, I got all kinds of mitigating circumstances. Nobody talks like that. You only Nobody. talk about that when it's sex, pure and simple. Yeah. And when it comes to, and, and, and it's so dangerous because of that, because we're, we're talking about, um, you know, even when we're talking about fiducia, you know, sorry to bring it back to that, but Romans one and Paul saying, look, there are sins and then there are sins, you know, there are, yeah. there are, there are places where it gets so intrinsically depraved that it becomes an exemplar of how far humanity has drifted from God. And, and here we are talking about two people of the same sex. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's not like, you know, I mean, there fiducia doesn't say well they can't be sexually active no it, it incorporates the whole gamut whether they're active or not active doesn't matter it doesn't matter and 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 just to think that they could be playing they could be doing the, they can go to all what we could all imagine that that can't even be uttered right among the saints especially and yeah. en enjoying it and continuing it and somehow that is is rationalized into the possibility of a coexistence of a repentant heart that's open for a blessing it just becomes so it's like a huge waterfall on the message of jesus I oh think. it really is I, cardinal mcelroy of a papal favorite in his famous america magazine essay on these issues now about a year ago or six months ago whatever it was Flat out said, we need to stop making distinctions between LGBTQ Catholics that are that are chaste and those that are not, because that drives a wedge between the LGBTQ community. And I'm thinking, well, oh, well, God forbid that we would drive a wedge through that community. We can drive a wedge through the Catholic community. I guess that's OK. Let's divide the church right down the middle in very divisive ways. That's OK. Right. But we dare not divide the LGBTQ community. But <clears throat> I'm reminded. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm still lingering respiratory stuff from me too, various me too. viruses. But anyway, I'm reminded, you know, St. Paul says with regard to the law, Christians have to do two things. They have to avoid meat sacrifice to idols. You're aware of this, right? And, yep. and he says sexual immorality. Now, of course, linking those two things together was no accident because there was also a sexual component, obviously, as well in some of the temple cults. Uh, and so he's he's warning Christians to avoid idolatry and he links sexual immorality into that. And so my point would be, and I got this from my co former colleague, Rodney Hauser, and I think this is true, that when 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 as a church, when we're looking out at sexual behaviors uh, that we want to be pastoral towards and merciful, to, we have to be careful what kind of idolatry we might be encouraging, what kind of idolatry we might be. In other words, when people use the acronym LGBTQ all right, to describe all of this, you, you're describing an ideology. You're describing an idolatry. You're describing an alternative worldview to that of the Christian worldview. And so when you say we need to be more welcoming to the LGBTQ community and so forth, and we need to have blessings very informal for these people, what what exact what in a sense what ordo what idolatrous ordo are you now transferring the church's pastoral praxis into mm, mm. okay is it into an ordo of idolatry or into an ordo of regeneration and sanctification it, it's one or the other you you cannot have it both ways that's a very good point very apt point um and and you know what happened there in acts 15 in jerusalem also reminds me of the situation um, in uh, the Corinthian community where you had the man who was involved with an, he was in an incestuous relationship with his stepmother, his father's wife. Yeah. yeah. And um, Paul heard about it through a, a, a family. He says the household of Chloe and 
he he's all he heard he didn't even have to go there to like see if this person had mitigating circumstances or do like a psychological evaluation yeah. he just said i'm not there in the flesh but i am there in spirit and when you gather together deliver such a one to satan for the destruction of the flesh now i understand that you know church discipline has taken a variety of forms over the last 2000 years but the point you just made is illustrative there paul's priority there was the purity of the community and so right. he didn't even need to go and meet the person to say well does this person is this guy is he between a rock and a hard place and he's just got to be with this woman or no he's like no this look his soul is in the balance and you're you're mistreating his soul by not tr uh, attending to this disciplinary act that's right and that, that's Absolutely. lost today it's very lost today and uh, one last thing before producing, before I move on to a different topic, and, and, and it's and it's this um, the the notion that the, the, the church can now bless sinners is, is, is some sort of in other words, there's clearly something new going on in Fiducia, and it's it's the whole gay union thing that that's very clear. Because my point is that priests have always been able to bless sinners. Yeah. I mean, there's a really good blessing you can get from a priest as a sinner. It's in the confessional, and that blessing comes with a lot of stuff attached to it that's really good. Yeah. Uh, and and so at some point, Cardinal Fernandez says in Fiducia, you know, like, well, nobody's morally perfect, and so we can't expect moral perfection before somebody gets a blessing. Well, who? My point is, are there not a bunch of straw men being attacked in this document? Yeah. I mean, have we not already always priests on the ground? If I were a priest, I'd be kind of insulted by this document. The insinuation is I'm I've been a we've been a finger wagging, morally judgmental church for centuries. And now we need to get over that stuff. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, the uh, the, the call to repentance, you know, um, you know, that, look, I, I understand that, you know, sometimes Pope Francis has said that. Um, he's being quoted right now in this one meme going around where he says, when some, when a sinner come, when an, an injured person comes to a hospital, you don't ask him if his cholesterol is in order and his heart rate's right. in order before you treat yep. the wounds. No, 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 no. You treat the wounds. Then we could talk about the rest afterwards. Right. Well, who's going to object to something like that? That's a beautiful yep. description of, of, of the, of the basic method of the church. Um, of course, we want to talk about the the whole the charisma, God's initiative, what God has done in Christ for us. You know that we, that when we were sinners, when we had nothing to give Him, when we had only our sins to nail Him to the cross, He humbled Himself and hung on the cross for our sins, being God and man. Right? We could talk about that. But you don't come full circle with the gospel if you don't preach repentance. And, right. I, you know, finger wagging moralism, obviously, that's, you know, that's not what I don't know anybody who's really trying who to does that, who does that. Yeah. So I, I think that uh, it's kind of tr it's trying to code itself with this, you know, well, we're, I'm I'm choosing the merciful route. Like, I'm not going to demand right. perfection. I'm choosing the merciful route. Well, when ears hear that, it's like, oh, yeah, well, I guess he's opposing the perfectionist route versus the merciful route. He's taking the merciful route. Who's Who can't go with that? Who can object to that? So, but my question would be, you know, it's, it's a field hospital. Yeah, but not a hospice. We're not just right. there to hold their hands while they're dying. <laughs> All right. Uh, you're supposed to, it's still a hospital. You're supposed to cure them. Uh, and he says, yeah. okay, put a bandage on, uh, on the wound before you get onto these other things. Well, if a gay couple comes to a priest and say, hey, Father, bless us, bless us as a couple, what's the wound that's being dealt with there? What's the wound? Alienation from the church, a sense maybe of distance from the church, a sense of being pushed away from the church. Is that the wound that that kind of a blessing is meant to heal? I, I don't know. See, but that doesn't even heal because that's they, my point. Yeah, they, they, they're still saying God wants us to be pure. We don't. Yeah, and, and that's because it's on their terms. Yes. Please bless us. 
we're wounded by our alienation from the church, but it's the church that's doing the alienating. Yeah. So get on with it. Yeah. And that's anyway. the thing that, that's the majority of the, uh, uh, you know, I, I obviously I don't, I have not met every gay couple out there who's seeking these blessings, but you know, I've been in the church long enough. I've been involved with ministries and parishes. I've, I've, you know, seen what looks to be the majority of these cases um, that I've experienced. They're not, they're not interested in um, really come in full circle with God's will for them. They're, they're waiting for the church right. to make adjustments. And so right. why this huge declaratio for the minority? Because within the, within the, within the whole pie of the gay Catholic community, how much of that pie is really these people who are on the cusp of repentance? They just need to get that public blessing together, and that might just lead them over to finally repent. Like, how many within the pie are really of yeah. that? You know, so very whole, few. Yeah. So, this whole discipline for the sake of the few, when the majority are going to clearly see it as an adjustment their way. It's a rainbow celebration. You know, that's yeah. why Father Martin was so happy with it. Um, but anyway, uh, OK, that's a, that's a great conversation on fiducia. And um, I think it really hit some good points. But now I want to get on to something that I know some of your readers have asked you and my readers have asked me, which is as, as faithful, sort of orthodox, devout, conservative, whatever you want to call us Catholics, who take the magisterium seriously and the papacy seriously. I mean, it's easy if you're like a liberal progressive who doesn't believe in the infallibility or indefectibility of the church or her doctrines. The church is just another religion among many religions and it can make mistakes. And so we just wanted to get on the change bandwagon and here we go. That's easy. All right. Or it's really easy to be a, a kind of sede vacantist, real, real, real right wing trad type, kind of like what Cardinal Vigano has Archbishop Vigano has become now, you know, where you just you right. pick up your marbles and you walk away and you say, OK, false church. Uh, yeah. We thought that was the right church, but now the church is making mistakes. So it's the false church. So sayonara, we're out of here. So you got the progressives saying we don't care about truth. You get ultra right wingers saying we care about truth. This church doesn't have it. So we're gone. Well, what does that where does that leave the rest of us then, Eric? Because uh, I get this all the time. Some of my good friends have written to me and said, you know, Larry, back off. You're you're at the edge. You're going to drive people out of the church with all of your incessant Pope Francis, this Pope Francis, that. So stop. Cease this is. And as a good priest friend of mine in Rome said to me once, uh, and he's a big sort of critic of Pope Francis, too. So don't get me wrong. He wasn't being critical of me, but he was saying in it, that there is a cautionary tale in all of this, which is no matter how much we might think Pope Francis is, is bad, you know, in many ways, we want there to be a papacy that is intact when he's gone. We want yeah. there to be a papacy left after he's gone. So we don't definitely we certainly don't want to go scorched earth and say, yep, Pope's teaching heresy. Pope's wrong. So what is your sort of take on this? Then I'll give mine. Yeah, so it, it's, it's, you know, I'll be frank here. Uh, I don't have all the answers to my questions, let alone everybody else's, because I, I am right. also getting messages, you know, probably got five since we started talking about what yeah. to do because of this. Should I leave? Should I become Eastern Orthodox? Well, you know, I've already given my reasons on my my channel on Eastern Orthodoxy. That's not an option. Um, but <clears throat> you know, there's I, I I'm taking from history here. Okay, so in my research, which I, I and I I told you I'd probably pull this up at one point. And oh yeah, I want you to plug your book. Yes, yeah, Eric's yeah. book. Everybody so buy I, it. This is with uh, St. Paul Center in in uh, Illinois Emmaus Road. Uh, publications. I wrote a whole book on the papacy in the first thousand years because it's it's its subtitle is revisiting the debate between Catholics and Orthodox, and um, there are many scenarios in the first millennium where we do see papal failures. 
And we do see a variety of responses to them um, from saints and sinners um, and canonized saints too. Um, and I think that sometimes we can forget that those scenarios have happened and not just in the context of, you know, a locution or, 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 you know, um, private letters circulating throughout the patriarchs, but even at ecumenical councils. And so I think that there's historical precedent that makes it worth revisiting the question as to how much damage can be done from the human element of the papal office. And um, even when those failures happened, you know, nobody thought the papacy was false. I mean, we, we, history moved on and, 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 and the papacy was, you know, became a blessing more than it ever was a curse. Um, but then you move into the second millennium and papal centralization became very strong. And, you know, fast forward all the way up, pass through conciliarism to Vatican I and into the 21st century, the, the question of non-infallible versus infallible categories became a very hot subject of discussion. What does it mean if it's not infallible? Does that mean it's just another probable human opinion? Um, or in, and is yeah. only am I only bound to, to believe the infallible? Well, that became a huge talk among magisterial theologians, you know, after Vatican I. And after Vatican II, you had a number of test case scenarios that really brought the magisterium to have to think about what do we do with this non-infallible category? I mean, we made it, we, we, we taught the faithful that there's this non-infallible category and we've got the Kurins and the Hans Kungs and the Shilobeks and the other people who have been testing the limits of this. And, you know, they eventually, there was, there were calls from faithful theologians, Hey, Rome, you've got to come up with a document that talks about what can be done when somebody has a formed conscience against one of the non-infallible decrees of yeah. the Holy See. Eventually they came out with, you know, Donum, Donum for eight, Veritatis, right? That was 1992, yeah. I think. Yeah, and a long time ago now. Exactly. A long time. I think 1992, I'm thinking, you know, I, I was just a kid, you know, and, but back then I don't remember global communications being as they are now. Well, there's, and, uh, I mean, uh, 1992, I was in the middle of doctoral studies and the internet was just barely getting started. I had dialed up America online yes. with that screeching sort of, you know, just, and it would take you forever to send a simple message to somebody. That was what it was in 92. Yeah. And, and so at the time, you know, the meeting of the minds behind Donum Veritatis, you know, that document might have been two years in the making, three years, maybe more. Um, now we're at a stage where we are consuming everything coming out of the Vatican. We're cons and, and not just theologians who are capable. We've got people like myself who can make predictions yeah. as to what the Vatican's going to do next. Um, and, and we're in this constant flow of information and communication. And we could say, oh, that's your problem. Get off the internet. That's not going to resolve anything. People aren't going to do that. People are still going to make use of this communication venue. And so I, I really do think that there, there needs to be, and it's obviously not going to happen under Pope Francis, um, but there needs to be a revisiting of Donum Veritatis with a clear recognition for the 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 beauty of Donum Veritatis, um, but with a recognition that modern times have required a, a, an enhancement explanation to this, in particular on the question of the. Um, how you know what can this 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 opening up of a withdrawal of assent you know because donum veritas talks about 
the possibility of a theologian, you know, because of something his conscience cannot, you know, within the non-infallible dissemination of the magisterium, um, there seems to be a category, you know, a room for this, you know, it can't be a public dissent, it can't, you know, rush to the media, all those qualifications, right? But that was 1992. I think we're at a time now where yeah. we need to incorporate history with, you know, failures did go very far from the magisterium, um, not in the infallible magisterium, which is absolutely guaranteed not to be, it's totally immune from error, right? But in the non-infallible magisterium, can there be something kind of incoherent, perhaps maybe not outright wrong, um, but can there be something so incoherent that it becomes abusive enough for the sheep, you know, yes. small and, you know, incorporating all of those theological nuances about the census fidei, uh, the people of God from Vatican II, head and members and the whole people of God, incorporating all the theories around that and developing a fresh Dona Veritatis version too, which um, maintains the pure authority of the magisterium. Does the magisterium deserves the presumption of truth. We, we presume the church is going to be right. Yes, yes, yes. Um, but there has to be a way for there to be feedback in the non-infallible arena when it becomes this clear, but Yes. And in the, in the 1870s, it was not clear that a pope was going to be doing something like this. That's exactly right. And, um, and so I think that's I, I, that's where I'm at right now. You know, I'm with you. I don't have all the answers. And people are always saying, what's your grand overarching theory of magisterial authority? Because you clearly think this pope is making mistakes and so on and so forth. And I've also pointed out the fact popes have made mistakes before, too, before this one. And you've done that, too. I, I think, for example, of Pope Leo and Nick Serge Domine saying, yeah, yeah it's, it's OK to burn heretics at the stake. It's kind of unclear what he really I mean, it's a bunch of it's a bunch all the of grades and the, the yeah. censures. You know, and all where, that. where does it fit in the bit? It's bottom line is, yeah, Luther's wrong. Yeah. Yeah. We can't burn. And boy, at the end of that document, he says, this is from me, successor of Peter. And if you disagree with this, you are a perfidious yeah. heretic from hell. Blah, blah, blah. I mean, it's, right. I mean, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, obviously. But so the point is, OK, how do we how do we deal with this? I think you you said something very interesting. You used the word abusive. And I, I want to come back to that because what, what, obviously, in some sense, the, even under Pope Francis, and that's why I make a big deal about this, he's not a heretic and he hasn't taught formal heresy. Cardinal Fernandez has not taught formal heresy. So the indefectibility, in, infallibility of the church and the papal office is intact. OK, we need to remember, though, it's an infallibility is a negative charism. It's not a right. positive charism like the inspiration of Scripture. It's right. a negative charism. All it's saying is the Holy Spirit's going to preserve the pope from making, a, you know, an error of substance in a matter of faith and morals. OK, so when the pope issues a dogma, it's not even guaranteed that that dogma is necessarily in the most felicitous expression possible. Right. Uh, further nuancing of the, how it's worded could possibly be played out. It's a negative. All it is is, well, this dogma contains no errors. In that sense, it's true. OK, and you can you can hang your hat on its truth because it contains no errors. OK, that's the sort of but we've gradually inflated and bloated that into uh, it's it's almost like holy writ. It's like right. it's like sacred scripture. And then there's been this what what the Monsignor Guarino calls infallibility bloat to all of the other lesser doctrines of the church so that the papacy has taken on this grand patina of infallibility of all things like the oracle on the Tiber. And, and in some sense, I think one of the benefits that Pope Francis has brought to the church, and I was guilty of this too during the John Paul era, is a sort of cult of personality with regard to the papacy and this adulation of the papacy as a rock star and all this kind of stuff. Uh, so bottom line is this. OK, I, I think the papacy is intact. The church is indefectible. Her infallibility is intact. What has been what has been undermined is uh, an ancillary doctrine 
of the church that says that not only does the Holy Spirit guide the Pope in terms of making infallible statements ex cathedra, that the Holy Spirit guides the Pope's prudential judgments as well. And, and that I've seen some of the Pope explainers point this out, that the Pope can make errors of prudential judgment, but the Holy Spirit's going to make sure that they're rare, that they're not common, and, and, and therefore that we can safely trust even the prudential judgments of a Pope. And I think that's kind of taken a hit here under this papacy, this notion. And, and I think that's, a, that's something that a new Donum Veritatis would have to take a look at. Like, do we really, can you really read 2000 years of church history and come away with the idea that the Holy Spirit is strongly guiding the Pope in his prudential decisions on, on matters, even the, like economics and politics and things like that? I don't think so. So I'm going to come back to the word abusive. I say this, all of the piety that we owe to the papacy, all the different from like Lumen Gentium 25 statements that you, know, you see all the time on the Internet now from the Pope Splainers about, uh, you know, Ecce Sacerdus Manum, all the glories that we owe to the Pope and so on. Great. All of that presumes that the Pope is our holy father and he's a good father. Just as, but we need to remember that all of that stuff with regard to papal piety is not a commandment on the on the level of the Decalogue, right? right. It's right. not a commandment up there on on that level. This is an invented moral teaching of the Church later on that accrued to the filial obedience that we owe to the Vicar of Christ. Fine, I agree with that. I agree with that filial obedience. But you know, just as in the Decalogue, the Decalogue is a stronger statement than all of these statements about the obedience we owe to the Pope. And the Decalogue says, honor your father and your mother, all right? That's an absolute moral commandment. But what do you do if your father's abusive? What do you do if your father's beating the heck out of your mother and raping your sister? What do you do then? Honoring your father in that instance means calling the police mm -hmm. and getting your father incarcerated, which is the best thing that could happen to your father. And that's it. Obviously, I'm not calling on the Pope to be arrested. Right. And I'm not saying that he is a sinner on that level. What I'm saying is what the church has never before, I think, taken seriously the possibility that a holy father might be an abusive father yeah. and, and, and do things to the faithful, to the faith, to the sheep that are literally just quite abusive. And, and uh, things like traditionis custodes, I think, are abusive. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't think it took into consideration at all the deep sensibilities of people for whom that liturgy is a dear, dear blessing. Uh, I mean, I'm not a big traditional Latin mass person myself, but uh, I, I was very critical of Traditionis Custodis because I thought it was draconian. On the one hand, the Germans are just going on their merry way, doing their merry thing. Meanwhile, Father Rupnik is still a, a priest in good standing doing his art there in his apartment in Rome. But uh, somebody who likes the traditional Latin mass can't go. Uh, yeah. And that sort of this is what I'm talking. The, the, and now you've got fiducia supplicans coming out, which which, you know, I, I have I have gay friends who are living chaste lives who tell me that they feel thrown under the bus by this. Papacy. Absolutely. They feel absolutely abandoned by this papacy and stabbed in the back because they get it. They get grief from their fellow gays. And say, oh, you've imbibed the ideology of your oppressors. You're just a self-loathing homosexual. You need to get on board the gay train and stop all this Catholic nonsense. So then they turn to the church and traditionally they've had support from the church. And now the church just basically throws them under the bus, says, yeah, all your gay friends are right. OK, that's abusive to me. That's abusive. And therefore, my attitude is I owe the Pope, the Holy Father, filial obedience. And up and, and I did for five, six years with this Pope. I defended him to the point where I'm looking out and I'm like a son looking at his father abusing, abusing his sister and saying, yet, no, you, you, you're the obedience I owe to you stops when you start becoming abusive. Now, the Pope's plan is, who are you to determine when the Pope's abusive? Who do I have to be? Right. Have to be. Yeah, that's that. That's um, that's a good point because um, I think what's happening is uh, some people. Uh, by the way, the the Decalogue point that I want to remember that that's a good one because I'm a father of six boys and there are times where I've done things where I've given a command, I've required them to do something, and they just were not able to fulfill the what I was telling them. And no matter how many times I demanded it, it 
they they were on moral grounds to to object and i had to come i had to come around and say you know what dad was being unfair um and so even in the like a holy institution of marriage and family you've got that um with its divine foundation it's you know divine institution right marriage, you know just like the papacy of, is of divine institutions That's right um so that that point was, was was a great point um but what i see in people today is that they they have put so much investment in defending pope francis because this it, they, the way they see the papacy is like a, is like the heart lungs brain and nervous system of the human body if it's unhealthy then the whole body's unhealthy and if that's the case then christ is the one who's to blame because he gave us the papacy you know right and, and so they defend the papacy in a way to defend christ and and so they force themselves to reconfigure what their eyes see and they find ways to turn what's obviously bad into a 10-hour lecture on why it's okay and then they accuse people who who are have who, who use their common sense of being unfaithful and you see this kind of psychological yeah. abuse happening, like you mentioned, yeah. you know, in the family, when a wife is being abused by her husband so much, not just by physical physicality, but also he's got some evil philosophy that's convinced her that she's the problem. He's the hero. Yeah. And no matter who talks to her, whether it's her sister, her mother a uh, psychologist a police officer no matter what they say to her look you've got an objectively bad situation you need help your husband's not your your husband if you love him he needs help and it's like no 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 you don't get it you know you're the one that you, you know you're you're the one that's not getting it I, you know i'm you know I, he he sacrifices everything for us and you know you understand what i'm saying yeah. women can get into that and in, you know where they're psychologically um warped you know and so what's obviously bad to anybody else looking at it is for her reconfigured to be good and so what we have here is this fidocia supplicans you've got even in some cases some morris letizia um the, yeah. the the some other policies that have come out and everybody's kind of look at that, looking at this, not just Catholics, but our Orthodox friends, our Presbyterian friends, our Lutheran friends, our Baptist friends. They're all like, hey, dude, Eric, I love you, brother, man. I, you know, I, I just, you know, I don't know. I don't want to like, you know, insult you or anything, but I got to ask you, like, what's up, man? Like Pope Francis is doing this. Like, so yeah. when it's at that point, and then you still say, no, 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 you're the problem. You're the problem. You're not interpreting it right. You're not giving the nuanced into You're not the one that's going to that psychological enslavement that I was talking about before. All the yes. psychologists have the fancy names for it. I don't well, have a fancy name it's for become, it. It becomes cult-like, cult yes. in the bad sense of the word. So yeah. enclosed. And I, I once knew a woman. She was a, a, an adult student of mine. Susan. She was uh, a member of a very, very, very conservative wing of the Presbyterian Church in America. I, you would probably know better than I would uh, what that wing was. Uh, but she had an abusive husband who was physically abusive and had this emotional control over her. She finally had enough. So she called the police on him one day when when he had physically beaten her up. Her church threatened to excommunicate her, dragged her in and made her feel like you should have brought the issue to us, to the church because honor your husband. The husband is the head of the house. In other words, the whole sort of you owe your husband this absolute right. obedience. And how dare you go out to the civil authorities before you brought it to the church so they're threatening to execute. She's now happily remarried in Eastern Orthodox. Uh, lovely, lovely woman. But this is this is the what I'm talking about here. Uh, that that feeling the obedience we owe to the Pope, I would say, is under normal circumstances. Sure. <laughs> under ninety nine percent of the time, okay, under normal circumstances, uh, but you know, just as in most marriages, the husband does not beat up his wife, and right. so on. Uh, 
Uh, but what do you do in a situation where you do have a, a, a pope that, in a sense, has lost the right to that kind of filial obedience? And then uh, I would say this, who is disrespecting the office of Peter? Who? Those who are critical of this pontiff's sometimes, I think, pastorally unwise decisions, or the Pope himself? Is he, is he the one who is bringing discredit to the office of Peter? Now, I'm not, I'm just a lay person. I'm not one to make public accusations and say, yes, Pope Francis is definitely discrediting the office of Peter. But I do think some of his decisions cast into doubt, all right, whether or not he is a, a suitable, a suitable person to sit on the chair of Peter. And and now we have before our eyes cardinals that even he selected, and other cardinals that are or yes. that are using their office to say that. I mean, I was shocked to see Cardinal Seurat this morning come out and say that he he adds the uh, Episcopal Conference's rejection of fiducia to him his own. He says he adds his agreement as if it was equal yes. to theirs. And that's, you know, so <clears throat> we yeah. are late people, but we, what we're seeing now oh. are people who are not radical traditionalists. Um, Cardinal Seurat just three or four years ago was talking about the need to abide by the Pope as an essential mark of being a true Catholic. And yet we're, we're at this point now where I think we're at a, we're at the cusp of a development of understanding what is the max capacity for yeah, yeah. papal damage. Um, and um, it doesn't make me want to leave the Catholic church at all. You no, know, it, 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 in fact, it, it's made me just become more bold. And, um, and, and I, I, you know, I think it's just a, a, a time to, you know, be more in prayer and obviously, we're going to sin in the process. I mean, I've had to come out and say I'm sorry on a number of things. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, go, there is no other place to go. Christianity doesn't stand on two feet anywhere else, even with all this going on. Yes. And our faith and, is not the Pope. Our faith is in Christ. And absolutely. the Pope is Christ's vicar. But even Peter betrayed Jesus. You know, e e even Peter had to be opposed by Paul. That, you know, with regard to the, the Judaizers and the circumcision party and so on. This is this is not an absolutist regime of, you know, ich werde bei Gott und Pope Francis, you know, <laughs> is, you know, is Cardinal Mueller a traditionalist? Is he a dissenter, even though he's very, very, very critical of this papacy? Cardinal Sarah, Sarah and others. Right? I, I, I saw one of the Pope's pointers had a whole YouTube video called, you know, Cardinal Mueller's attack on the authority of Christ on the authority of Christ. Cardinal Mueller is attacking the authority of Christ because he's critical of Pope Francis. This is just so to me. Well, you that, can yeah. Yeah. you can dislike all of this criticism of the Pope. I'm fine. If you're in that school of thought, I know people that are these Pope planners that I actually like and I'm friends with and no big deal. You, you can go down that road. But OK, stop the nonsense about saying you've got someone who used to head the DDF for crying out loud, Cardinal Mueller, who isn't exactly a raving right wing radical traditionalist out there waving a red flag saying there is something really, really rotten in Rome right now. And when you have a holy man like Cardinal Sarah saying similar things or a Cardinal Zen for crying out loud, who this Vatican threw under the bus. Right. All right. Yeah. Go ahead. No, I, I think, yeah, those are all. Uh, good point. So, I, I mean, to to the listeners, you know, to my listeners, to my readers, my viewers, um, I don't have all the answers exactly what Maybe. to do. Um, it's a work in progress, you know. So tomorrow, I might know something that I didn't know today. Uh, um, um, of six months from now, I might have a better answer than I did today. Um, but what I can't do is I can't get rid of first principles <clears throat> just for the sake of Catholicism. Catholicism won't let me do that. Catholicism has too much of a robust understanding of the mind. 
um, for you know, and this this kind of gets into a whole thing about private judgment and the principle of paradigm and of authority and all that. But one of the things that we admit in the Catholic tradition is natural limits to the papacy. The pap- the Pope can't come out and say, "I order you never to obey me." I mean, just the command yeah. itself violates yeah. natural logic, right? Yeah, yeah. And what we're having to do here by some of these Pope splainers is violate first principles, deny what we see in front of us, yeah, and 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 sacrifice our minds for the for Catholicism. That's never been what Catholicism has ever ever been about. And to pursue the truth, I mean. Some of these Pope Splainers in 2021, when the DDF came out with its documents saying, no, you can't bless gay unions. They were front and center saying, see there, you trads, how wrong you have it about Pope Francis. See how orthodox he is. I bet you didn't see that one coming. I bet you didn't see the gloriousness of of this papacy coming down on the side of orthodoxy. So you take all your criticisms of Pope Francis back because look at this document. Three years later, it's like, oh, uh, never mind. Uh, now, now you're to be blamed because you're opposing this duck, you know. So, well, that's 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 actually illustrative because um, there are some of these, you know. And I'll go ahead and mention him. Is uh, Michael Lofton, you know, before said that you know it's not possible to bless relationships, you know, these gay relationships in a sense that you're not blessing the sinful aspects of the union but like perhaps the other good things that he says that was unacceptable. He also said it was unacceptable for couples to be blessed together. He said that would be a scandal. Um, and when then fiducia supplicans came out, he interpreted it that way, that it would have to be individuals and it would have to be done privately. And then he wrote a whole catechism for yeah. how to explain these things. But then he had to edit the catechism because and this is all public information yeah. he had to edit the pap- the catechism to fix that to say oh no actually it is couples coming together it is coming out in public maybe not in prominent places maybe not to create confusion but it is public and it is together so in other words some of these guys who are going all the way out to, to try and prove the that pro francis is orthodox they themselves are having they they in their own modifications and adjustments they're showing that they are struggling to do this yes and so what they should do is be candid and saying hey guys you know i really i'm 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 going to work my butt off to to defend pope francis and i'm not quitting but i understand where you where the opposing side is coming from and, exactly yeah. that's all we want okay i understand perfectly well your motivations as to why you want to defend the papacy at all costs. I was there yeah. too. All right. Yeah. I understand you, but please stop the recrimination. Stop that. You're a bad, bad, horrible Catholic line. If you don't right. agree with our defense of Pope Francis, that yeah. that's the part that annoys me the most because yeah. it, I mean, I mean, Mike Lofton, since we brought up his, has publicly said some, you know, not some nice things about me uh, in a YouTube video he did with Bob Pestici and, uh, Andrew Lacutis. Now, in their defense, they invited me on the show and I declined. I, I said to Andrew, who I like, you know, sorry, I, I just don't see the point to it. So they but they went ahead without me and proceeded to trash me anyway. Oh, wow. Well. Yeah. You know, in, in my absence, fine. I mean, I declined. So they, they went out with the show. It was kind of a, a trash Larry Chap, trash, trash Eduardo Echeverria uh, show. Um, oh, I know. You know. I know Ed very well. Oh, he's a great guy. And uh, but one of the things that I bring this up, maybe we should think about wrapping the oh, geez. Yeah, we've been on a long time. <laughs> anyway, I'm not going to bring that up. Let's let's just start. We've been on like an hour and a half now, so we should probably wrap this up. Uh, do you have any last any last words, Eric, before before we sign off? Um, you know, one number one, very grateful for coming on here. You know, I've been reading your stuff lately, um, more so than before, and uh, I find it very refreshing. In fact, um, when I started to read some of your comments, your articles now, um, it, it's, it's, it's actually made me feel more sane because I've always known oh, you to be thanks. a very sane commenter, commentator. 
Um, so that's number one, thankful to you and your viewers, um, for supporting you. Well, thanks. And Eric. then, um, number two, you know, if, if, uh, my door is open, if somebody out there, um, wants to discuss this in a public live format, I'm, I am open, you know, and, um, if it's going to help the body of Christ for me to be corrected or shown where I'm wrong, I want that to be public as well. And so, you know, any of the viewers there know anybody who wants to t talk about these things, um, let's, to, let's continue the conversation. Let's do. That's a great. I, I said in one of my previous videos, too, that uh, very soon I'm going to be figuring out uh, ways to, and I'm going to have live Q&A sort of uh, things with, with people that want to subscribe and, and join into the conversation. Because, yeah, it's great for you and I to have a conversation, but there's there is a there's a broad swath of the Catholics out there who would like to get their their voices heard. And I'm interested in hearing them. So anyway, I, I can't thank you enough for coming on. Finally, we 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 get to meet at least virtually uh, like like you were reading my stuff. I've been reading more and more of your stuff lately and thinking, wow, this this uh, Eric guy, man, he, he's got it. He's got it going. So I, I, that's why I just wrote to you out of the blue and said, hey, come on the show. Let's do it. And you said, yeah. So I'm glad you did. So maybe we could do this again in the sure. in the future. And uh, but anyway, thanks for coming on. And thanks to everybody for listening. And um, if you have any questions, you can post them, obviously, in the comments below and so on. I don't always answer in the comments section, but once in a while. Anyway, thanks again, everybody. Bye now.